Matheson in a 2016 interview on Forum Borealis. Dr. Robert Schock, whose work I greatly respect, was asked to list. If you could list, three let's say, the three best evidences, evidences for in the world for a global advanced civilization before age. the end of the last days, I, I said. Uh, I'll give you four. He answered that he would actually give four best evidences. The evidence described in his early work regarding the Great Sphinx in Egypt, the evidence discussed in his book Forgotten Civilization regarding especially the newly discovered monuments of Gobekli Tepe, the evidence at the megalithic site of Gunung Padang in Indonesia, and evidence related to Rapa Nui, or Easter Island. All of these lines of evidence can be said to be primarily archaeological, and I have no disagreement with the argument that we find an overwhelming amount of archaeological evidence around the world which points to the existence of an extremely sophisticated culture existing well prior to any civilization known to conventional history. However, I would add that another extremely important line of evidence can be offered which demonstrates beyond doubt the existence of an extremely sophisticated and likely worldwide culture prior to any civilization known to conventional history, and that line of evidence is mythological rather than archaeological. The evidence pointing to the existence of a system of celestial metaphor used by all the world's ancient myths around the globe and fully operational in the very earliest texts known to conventional history, including the ancient clay tablets of Mesopotamia, and the mythological references in the pyramid texts of ancient Egypt. The evidence can now be demonstrated with literally hundreds or even thousands of examples, some of which I've chronicled in my books, blog posts, and videos to date. Overwhelming evidence shows that the myths of the world from virtually every culture on every inhabited continent and island around the globe are closely connected and built upon a common system, a system of celestial metaphor in which the gods and goddesses, kings and queens, heroes and princesses, and other figures relate to specific constellations, constellations which are envisioned using the same method of outlining and which are associated with similar features and character traits around the world. I've already shown in many videos, for example, that the constellation Hercules is envisioned in very much the same way in cultures around the world, as a figure in a distinctive deep lunge with characteristic deep knee bend and brandishing a powerful weapon. This weapon is often associated with the most powerful weapon of any god within a particular myth system, such as the thunderbolt wielded by the god Zeus in ancient Greece, or the Vajra wielded by the god Indra, in ancient India, or the mighty hammer wielded by the god Thor in the Norse myths. And we see evidence that the thunderbolt god found in the various cultures of Central and South America was also associated with this very same constellation and depicted in the very same deep lunge posture and wielding a very similar thunderbolt weapon. This system can be seen to be operating in the ancient stories of the Gilgamesh cycle and the Enuma Elish of ancient Mesopotamia, in the myths of ancient Egypt, ancient India, ancient Greece, ancient China and Japan, and the sacred stories of other parts of Asia, other parts of Europe, the continents of Australia, in Africa, in the Americas, and the cultures of the Pacific, an absolutely astonishing situation, one that is basically impossible to explain within the conventional historical paradigm, but which would be understandable in light of the existence of some kind of global civilization thousands of years prior to any of the earliest civilizations known to the conventional model. The evidence that can be presented to demonstrate that the figures of ancient myth are directly related to the constellations of the heavens is sufficient to make this argument absolutely beyond doubt. Here, for example, is one of the clearest illustrations of the concept 
using an amazing example of ancient artwork from ancient Greece on the name vase, what's known as the name vase of the Pan Painter. Artwork showing the goddess Artemis in the act of slaying the unfortunate young prince Actaeon. As I've demonstrated in many previous videos, this scene can be shown to be based on the constellations Sagittarius and Scorpio. And there are many clues in ancient texts which indicate that the goddess Artemis in ancient myth is closely associated with the constellation Sagittarius and with certain characteristics associated with Sagittarius. The stories of the Bible can also be shown to be built on the very same system of celestial metaphor. The story of Jacob's Ladder, for example, is consistently depicted in artwork across centuries in a manner which indicates someone was very familiar with the celestial references in the text itself. In the text of Genesis chapter 28, Jacob is on the way from Beersheba to Haran, and he makes camp for the night, taking the stones for his pillows, and lies down to sleep and dreams, and beholds a ladder set upon the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and he beholds angels ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stands above it and speaks to Jacob, and this episode can be shown to be based on the region of the sky where the brightest part of the Milky Way galaxy stretches upward between Sagittarius and Scorpio, on past Ophiuchus, towards the constellation Hercules, and the two great winged figures of the Milky Way, the constellations Cygnus the Swan and Aquila the Eagle, can be seen in this region ascending and descending upon that heavenly ladder. And the depictions in artwork down through the centuries of this famous episode from Genesis 28 show the ladder wreathed in clouds which correspond quite accurately to this brightest region of the Milky Way band containing the galactic center and the famous dark rift. And Jacob asleep is usually depicted in a manner which corresponds either to the constellation Sagittarius or to the constellation Scorpio. And there's almost always a hill or mountain in the appropriate location to correspond to the constellation Ophiuchus, which plays the role of a mythical hill or mountain in many ancient myths around the world, including myths of ancient India and myths of ancient Greece. And this is just one small example from literally hundreds which can be found in the scriptures of what we call the Bible. Here's another example which provides compelling and I would argue conclusive evidence that the ancient myths are based on celestial metaphor and that this correspondence was understood in ancient times. This is a depiction of the hero Odysseus about to begin slaying the suitors who've been freebooting in his home while he was away, devouring his wealth while doing nothing productive on their own, and in fact actively scheming to murder Odysseus's son Telemachus and to sleep with Odysseus's wife Penelope. When you see a figure holding a bow at this angle, as opposed to up here like this, which is characteristic of the way the constellation Orion holds a bow, when you see a figure holding a bow at this angle, that angle of holding the bow is very suggestive of the constellation Sagittarius in the heavens, which also holds a bow at this particular height and angle, just as we saw in the artwork on the name vase of the pan painter depicting Artemis in the act of slaying Actaeon. So, in this particular piece of ancient artwork, Odysseus is depicted in a position that corresponds to Sagittarius, and the suitors that he is slaying are depicted in a manner which corresponds to the adjacent constellations of the zodiac. As I explained in my 2016 book, Star Myths of the World, Volume 2, Myths of Ancient Greece. This suitor right here is easily identified as corresponding to the constellation Scorpio, just as Acteon in the previous artwork corresponds to Scorpio. 
we see the same angle of the body that we saw in the depiction of Acteon, corresponding to the angle of Scorpio relative to Sagittarius in the night sky. This suitor, reclining on a couch and reaching out an arm to tell Odysseus not to shoot him, corresponds to the constellation Virgo, which has the distinctive feature of appearing to be reclining in the heavens and of having one distinctive outstretched arm marked by the star Vinda Mietrix, which figures prominently in many ancient myths from around the world and in ancient artwork. And who's this figure? In between the suitor representing Virgo and the suitor representing Scorpio, this figure crouching down here and hiding behind a table, which he's picked up as a sort of shield against the bow and arrows of Odysseus. That figure corresponds to the zodiac constellation between Virgo and Scorpio in the heavens, the constellation Libra, which can be envisioned as a small table and, in fact, is depicted as a small table in other artwork based on this very same region of the heavens, such as this artwork depicting the famous haircut given to Samson by Delilah in the book of Judges in the Bible. In this ancient artwork showing Odysseus about to slay the suitors, the ancient artist has even included a beautiful design corresponding to the column of the Milky Way, which rises between Sagittarius and Scorpio in the heavens or between Odysseus, who corresponds to Sagittarius in this artwork, and the suitors corresponding to Scorpio, Libra, and Virgo. In other words, this design is in the proper location to represent the brightest part of the Milky Way band in the heavens. These are just a few examples, but they are extremely compelling examples. I've provided hundreds and hundreds of other examples in my other writing and videos and blog posts. The existence of this system of celestial metaphor, which can be objectively demonstrated to be operating in mythology from cultures literally around the globe, argues very strongly for the existence of an ancient civilization or culture predating ancient Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia and ancient India in ancient China, because this system is already present in the myths of all these most ancient civilizations known to conventional history today. In that interview referenced at the beginning, Dr. Schock mentions mythology as evidence for an ancient civilization. And Dr. Schock also explains why it is so important to us to recognize the truth about our ancient history because if this ancient civilization was destroyed by some cataclysm or catastrophe, which it appears that it was, then this has tremendous implications for us today. And we want to learn as much as we can about what happened, especially if, as Dr. Schock believes, that catastrophe has to do with cycles of violent solar activity which could threaten our civilization today. Additionally, as the host of that interview, Al Borealis, points out, when you don't know anything about your past, you're much easier to manipulate. He says towards the end of the podcast, if you, if you want, want to control, control someone, someone, remove them their memory. memory. Make, Make them, them believe their children. Their children. The evidence in the world's ancient myths provides powerful confirmation that the history we're being taught in school and reinforced by the media, including educational history shows, is false and in need of radical revision. The fact that the myths around the world are part of an extremely ancient and worldwide system is supported by so much evidence that it should be beyond any doubt at this point. And these myths contain extremely important truths that we need today, even in this very present moment. And I am absolutely convinced that we are better able to hear and absorb what they're trying to tell us when we listen to them in the language that they are actually speaking. 
which is a metaphorical language, an esoteric language, and a celestial language. Thank you.